here we are. Um, I'm a little nervous too because I hope that myself and um, Warren's papers don't disagree because if they do, I would take her over my, over me. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a part kind of, and I'll say this in a little bit of a, of a work in progress. And so, so here we go. From her first trip up the Nile in 1862 until tuberculosis killed her in 1869, the same year the Suez Canal opened, Lucy Lady Duff Gordon wrote hundreds of letters back home to her mother, Sarah Austin, her husband, Sir Alexander Duff Gordon, and her three surviving children. She described her journeys up the Nile, the ways in which she negotiated daily life, where she lived, what she ate, and who she spoke to each day. She wrote home about national and local politics, her life in Luxor, and how she spent her time teaching and nursing the community of about 5,000 residents. She told them how much she loved and was loved by the people of Egypt. She rarely wrote about antiquities and didn't really ever visit any tombs or temples for the purpose of knowing ancient Egypt, but her life and letters would have an outsized impact on the discipline of Egyptology because of the way she opened up Egypt for others to see what living there was like. It was in these letters, first published in 1865 as Letters from Egypt, and later reissued in a new edition after her death um, as Last Letters from Egypt in 1875, that she left her complicated legacy. Her letters show a woman whose life as a colonizer in the colonial context would impact everything she did in Egypt. She stole antiquities, accepted the ownership of multiple enslaved people, and eventually forced her own maid, Sally Naldred, in, into an impossible decision. And I don't mean to like leave a cliffhanger there, but if I explain it now, it just like blows the whole thing. Anyway, um, it would be a really long introduction. <laughs> in this paper, which is part of a work in progress, I'll discuss how her letters, as published in 1865 and then in 1875, didn't tell her full story, and so became her fraught legacy. This isn't to say that uh, Duff Gordon was a bad person. I'm not here to make value judgments on her self-reported behaviors necessarily, but I'm here to argue that she was a complex woman whose sense of morality and cultural norms in the British colonial context would impact everything she did in Egypt. Duff Gordon's time, work, travel, and Egypt, travel in Egypt built the problematic foundation on which the women who came after her were able to stand. In fact, she was not only a product of her time, she was a producer of this context as well. The things she did were so ingrained into the colonial travel culture at the time that the choices she made, which she portrayed in her letters, simply planted seeds in an already fertile soil for the colonization and exploitation of Egyptians by the British in the late 19th century. When Lady Duff Gordon arrived in Egypt in 1862, Egypt had not yet been made easily accessible for Westerners by the British travel giant Thomas Cook, but she, she was used to making her own path. She and her maid Sally went to Egypt because of the tuberculosis Duff Gordon had contracted several years before, and she was looking to make her symptoms better. This was planned to be one short trip that Duff Gordon was sure would cure her ailments. Her daughter Janet's connections in Alexandria helped her hire, hire a dragoman or guide, a man named Obar, sorry, Omar Abu Halawa. Omar's family was in the pastry business, and his surname was a great indicator of his trade. He was the father of sweets. Omar then helped her hire a private houseboat, a Dahabeya in Cairo, and a crew, and, and a crew and Lucy Sally Omar um, and the crew sailed up the Nile, seeing sights along the way. Sally Naldret, I don't have a photograph of her um, or any kind of um, picture of her at all, was almost 30 years old when she met Omar. Omar's job was to guide the women around Cairo, help them start to learn Arabic phrases, and accompany the women up and back down the Nile. Duff Gordon's letters hardly mention Sally, despite the fact that she was so dependent on her maid. In Cairo, Duff Gordon noted that, quote, Omar took Sally sightseeing all day while I was away into several mosques. He is put out at my not having provided her with a husband long ago, as is one's duty towards a female servant, end quote. The two servants spent a lot of time together without Lucy. They got to know each other and bonded over caring for Lucy, who could be demanding and exacting. Later, as they were both sailing back down the Nile, uh, Duff Gordon commented that at Dendera, 
Quote, Sally's delight at the temples was boundless as she rode a dozen miles on a donkey without saddle or bridle to see them intrepidly. She enjoyed her travels thoroughly and is as fond of the Arabs as I am. She and Omar are great friends, end quote. By this point in their journey, like their other boatmen who called out to Sally as she rode by, Omar had taken special notice of Sally. And this is going exactly where you think it's going. <laughs> he always made sure she had a good donkey to ride so that she could see everything he had to show her. Lucy was delighted that her two servants were friends themselves. So Sally and Lucy left and returned to Egypt in subsequent years, and they eventually settled in the small town of Luxor at the Maison de France. Known as the French house, she arranged to live there because of its location close to the Nile. She thought it would, quote, be the most comfortable, indeed the only comfortable one there. It was well within the village inside the temple, and Duff Gordon relished the thought of living among Egyptians. She described the house to her husband in a uh, letter of January 1864, right after they moved in. She said, quote, I have such a big rambling house all over the top of the Temple of Luxor. We had about 20 fellas to clean the dust of three years accumulation, and my room looks quite handsome with carpets and a divan. The view all around my house is magnificent on every side, over the Nile in front, facing northwest, and over a splendid range of green and distant orange buff hills to the southeast, where I have a spacious covered terrace. It is rough and dusty to the extreme, but will be very pleasant. I have glass windows and doors to some of the rooms. It is a lovely dwelling. And she was basically, sort of, a lot of times she sort of begged um, her husband to come to Egypt. Um, and that's a, that's a big drama. Um, the village within the Luxor temple uh, where Lucy, Sally, and Omar lived had more than 30 other dwellings, yards, pigeon towers, and only one European neighbor, the photographer Antonio Beto. Duff Gordon was welcomed into the inner circle of the foreign consuls and their wives, as well as with the residents she met in the markets and those who tried to sell trinkets to her on the street. She fit in immediately, she claimed. Duff Gordon jealously guarded her life in Luxor and wrote home to her family about how much her friends in Egypt needed her. Her friend Sheikh Yusuf's brother, Muhammad, had returned home to Luxor from Cairo very ill. Duff Gordon found a few bottles in her medicine stash that might help him, so she went to his house, not more than a cow shed to her, to treat him. She told her family that she, quote, found him gasping for breath and very, very ill. I gave him a little soothing medicine and put mustard plasters on him as it relieved him. I went again and repeated them. She also confessed to her husband that Muhammad, quote, held up his delicate brown face for a kiss like an affectionate child. As I kissed him, Sheikh Muhammad's old father, a splendid old man in a green turban, thanked me with effusion and prayed that my children might always find help and kindness, end quote. She continued, well aware of her cultural trespass, quote, I suppose if I confessed to kissing a, quote, dirty Arab in a hovel, the English travelers would execrate me. But it shows how much there is in Musul Musulman bigotry, unconquerable hatred, etc., but you also are sort of left wondering, you know, she was making excuses for herself and sort of saying, I just wish everybody else could be more open-minded. Um, so that's part of the problem. As she left the house, she made sure um, he was lying still and sleeping. And even after all of her administrations, almost a week later, Muhammad died. But his family was so thankful that Lucy was able to help him in his final days and word began to spread of her healing and comforting powers. She needed her husband to know that she was being useful to someone. In April of 1864, there was a terrible intestinal ep epidemic brought on, Duff Gordon thought, by the hard work of the harvest in intense heat and the beans and corn people were eating straight from the fields. Duff Gordon blamed Ismail's policies of forced labor for the epidemic. Without treatment, people's bowels would get stopped up and they would die in almost exactly eight days. Lucy, however, had brought an enema, um, which helped clear blockages, and everyone who sought her treatment in time survived. Most of her patients were Egyptian, but she told her husband that they were Christians, and she said that some of them were even kind. <laughs> Lucy, born into the noblesse oblige, thought that she should be sought for counsel, medicine, food, and thereby as an example of holiness. Like she thought, of course, um, she, you know, she should be seen in that way. Her neighbors began to call her Sati Nur Ala Nur, or Lady Light from the Light, 
as holy of a name as they could give a white woman. But while from her reports she said she had saved several lives, her lived experiences among her beloved people had not changed very much. She'd been gifted many stolen objects from Egypt, but none so problematic as the enslaved children people brought to her charge. The first was Zainab, a girl given to her by American Consul William Thayer in 1863. He had received Zainab as a gift, but his other servants were cruel to her, so he wanted to give her to Lucy because he heard that Lucy was kind. In the end, she left Zainab with her daughter Janet and her husband Henry Ross in Alexandria. And Duff Gordon said that she seemed at peace there with Janet's staff, and in the time she lived there had, quote, grown fatter and, if possible, blacker. But those were not compliments. But she had also become more intelligent, Zainab had, but, quote, a little louder and bolder and hard to manage. Lucy complained to her husband that, quote, the Berber men have put it into her head that we are inferior beings and that Zainab had become, according to Lucy, quote, quietly sullen and displays great religious intolerance. Zainab may have been with Duff Gordon for some time, or she may have given her yet again to another home in the end. Um, there are a couple Zainabs in the letters, and so it's, it's hard to figure out um, which one she's talking about. In 1866, she received another enslaved boy. William Gifford Palgrave stopped to visit um, Lucy in the spring of that year, and he had known Duff Gordon from her letters, as so many did. And he arrived in Luxor to ask her about a dispute between Mustafa Aga and August Mariette. Aga and others in the area, for sure, were known for selling antiquities from tombs and temples um, in the area to tourists coming through. Lucy herself had been the beneficiary of a number of these sales, like when she gladly accepted a silver ring from an excavation and she sent it home. Palgrave, however, was in town as a new representative of the British government in Luxor to investigate these kinds of issues. Duff Gordon, on the other hand, was not willing to help, and even if she found Palgrave nice enough, she didn't like him very much. He got no information out of her. But she got a boy that he had enslaved. His name was Mabruk, and Lucy agreed to keep him because she thought he would be a good servant for her. They got along well, but soon enough, William Palgrave uh, began writing to her, wanting to um, take Mabruk back. And Lucy tried to refuse and wrote to her mother in March of 1867, quote, I'm going to write to Palgrave and ask him to let me send another boy or the money for Mabruk, who can't endure the notion of leaving me. She ended up keeping him until at least late September of 1867, but she had thought about not only keeping a person enslaved, but also possibly selling him as a commodity, um, and this presents Duff Gordon as a woman participating in the oppressive colonial institution that had long been de rigueur for Europeans in Egypt, even after the trading of enslaved people was abolished in England in 1807 um, and within the colonies, um, with the colonies ending the practice in 1838. But Egypt was not yet um, a colonial, um, quote unquote, protectorate of England at that point. Sally Naldret, a servant and not an enslaved person, uh, was always with Lucy, but again, rarely showed up in the early letters. She was in her early 30s, much younger than Lucy, and healthy, of course. She was pretty, Lucy thought, but not beautiful. Unlike Lucy, Sally was able-bodied and strong. She spoke Arabic as well as Lucy did, and what, Lucy wondered, would she do without Sally? It was 1864. We're jumping back a little bit in time. The women had been in Egypt for over a year, and Lucy's health got steadily worse. Sally and Omar hardly left her side, except during the really hot days, when Lucy's lungs did much better outside, and Sally and Omar remained behind in the house to stay cool. By the 20th of December, 1864, the trio began to make their way uh, back, to Luxor for, back to Luxor from Cairo. A few days later, late on Christmas Eve, the boat was moored on the banks of the Nile, far from any town. It was late, it was pitch black, but the stars were bright in an almost moonless sky. Then Lucy heard Sally cry out for her. Lucy sat up and started coughing immediately because her tuberculosis was getting worse. As Lucy rushed into Sally's room, she saw that Sally was sweating and breathing hard. Even in the stupor of sleep and disease, Lucy could see that her maid was in labor with a baby. 
Making do with what meager supplies they had on board for an event like this, Lucy helped to bring the child, thankful it wasn't a difficult birth. And in what should have been a joyous occasion, Lucy was furious. Sally had hidden her delicate state for months from everyone except Omar. How could she betray Lucy like that? How could Sally hide being pregnant for nine months? Lucy, on the other hand, couldn't hide her anger and disgust. She was beside herself. Um, her letters portray her as being jealous of Sally and Omar's relationship, but she would never fully admit that to anyone, um, to herself or to anyone else. She wrote to Janet that the baby was, quote, in my opinion, hideous and couldn't believe that it was, in fact, Omar's baby. Abdullah, as they named him, had fair skin and light hair and eyes. How could this light-skinned baby belong to Lucy's beautiful Omar? She wondered. But Omar knew the baby was his, and he and Sally were married in the new year. Sally and Omar were happy in their new life as a family of three, not including his other wife and children who were living in Alexandria. But the marriage wasn't enough for Lucy. She saw Omar as the poor childlike victim of Sally's seduction and argued that their marriage, while legal um, and legitimate in Egypt, was Omar's second marriage and not legal according to English law. She told Sally and wrote to Janet that the marriage, quote, is simply no marriage at all. Lucy moved quickly to fire Sally and told her that if she left her child in Egypt with Omar's uh, first wife, Mabruka, and returned home to England that no one would ever have to know of her affair. She told her mother that Sally would be just fine, as even though she would have to leave her son, Lucy wrote that Sally, quote, loses nothing but her place with me. Lucy was sure that, quote, if her family kept a quiet tongue, no one in England need ever know of her escapade here. She wouldn't listen to anyone about this. Lucy was right in her own eyes, and she would stand by her decision. So five months after Abdullah was born, on the afternoon of May 2nd, 1865, Lucy walked back into the French house feeling happy and free. She finally had her whole house back to herself, and of course, she had Omar. She felt like the last few months hadn't even been real, and once they had all returned to Luxor in early January with tiny baby Abdullah in tow, Sally and Abdullah had been exiled to one side of the house. Lucy couldn't be bothered by any baby wailing, and she couldn't look at the baby's face and be reminded of Sally's betrayal. She was really angry. I hope I'm getting that across. Um, Lucy herself, you know, sort of complained that she needed to rest. She needed to not be around Sally. Um, Alec, uh, Lucy's husband, uh, and Janet hadn't been supportive of her decision to get rid of Sally as she thought that they should be. She, they told her that Sally and Omar were people making their own choices and that she shouldn't punish either of them. But she couldn't believe it. Lucy thought um, it was obvious that Sally had seduced Omar and she was certain he would never have done anything like that on his own, nor would he have betrayed his wife, Mabruka. But Lucy never asked Omar what he wanted. To Omar, his marriage to Sally and her new, and her new son likely was not a betrayal to Mabruka. He was adding to his family. Lucy, on the other hand, thought Sally needed to be punished for what she'd done. The first edition of Duff Gordon's published letters did not have this story in it. Um, wisely, the family didn't want anyone to know about what Sally had done or how Lucy had reacted. Sally just sort of disappeared from the narrative. In later editions after Duff Gordon was dead, such as the 1902 edition, Janet included some of these letters, but, quote, left out purely family matter, which is of no interest to the public. Just kills you. <laughs> Duff Gordon's great-grandson, Gordon Waterfield, also included this story in the 1962 edition, but his edition left out other stories that had been in earlier editions. So surely there is more to Duff Gordon's story than anyone really knows. Interestingly, her story isn't that, isn't that different from the European men around the same time, stealing antiquities, enslaving people, and disrespecting the same people they claimed were friends. So what am I trying to accomplish here with these stories? Um, partly uh, establishing that biography um, shouldn't be hagiographic. We should be very careful about the kinds of stories that we write. Um, that we should try to tell the whole story or of as much of it as we know, even the really sort of nasty bits. Um, and not to make heroes out of regular flawed people because that just sets us up for disappointment. And, um, and I think most importantly that sort of methodology matters. Um, and, uh, you know, we were talking about anti-colonial 
um, aspects of things. And I think bringing out all of that first before we can decolonize it is what's really important. So thank you.